from ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. We begin tonight with a bright forecast for the upcoming Soviet-American summit, tempered by the one dark cloud that won't go away. President Bush said today he is looking forward to his next meeting with President Gorbachev at the end of May. Speaking for the Kremlin, Foreign Minister Shevardnadze predicted a wide range of agreements would be the outcome. Yet neither man could avoid Lithuania. Once again, Mr. Bush warned against the use of force, while Mr. Shevardnadze tried to explain what his boss was up to. ABC's Britt Hume is at the White House. The President and the Soviet Foreign Minister made a smiling appearance before cameras this morning as they continued what amounts to a joint U.S.-Soviet effort to continue business despite the unpleasantness in Lithuania. Their meeting went on for two hours and 20 minutes, more than twice its expected length. And yes, said Shevardnadze afterwards, Lithuania had been discussed. We're not avoiding a discussion of this question because we have a clear conscience on this. This is a question that the Lithuanian people will have to decide. The people have not yet spoken out. The people have not yet spoken out. That might come as a surprise to the Lithuanians who recently voted for independence, thus bringing Soviet tanks into their streets. Shevardnadze said such actions were necessary to keep what he called good public order. The president, speaking to newspaper editors later, repeated the U.S. position that there must be no violence and that the U.S. supports the Lithuanians' desire for self-determination. And I told Minister Shevardnadze that this is an issue that could adversely affect the prospects for progress in these important U.S.-Soviet relations. It remained unclear, however, just how Lithuania could affect U.S.-Soviet relations. For example, presidential spokesman Fitzwater said today the administration will not even comment on specific Soviet actions there. We believe it diminishes our influence, he said, if we get into individual episodes. No doubt a bloody crackdown in Lithuania would chill U.S.-Soviet relations and probably abort the summit. Short of that, though, Mr. Bush seems to be giving Mr. Gorbachev, in effect, a free hand to deal with Lithuania as he sees fit. Rit Hume, ABC News, the White House. There are seven weeks until the summit and the calendar cuts both ways. Long weeks of keeping an eye on what the Soviets do in Lithuania, seven short weeks to work out a host of agreements the two leaders wish to ratify, which is why Mr. Shevardnadze had another long round of meetings at the State Department today. Here's ABC's John McQuethy. After three days of what were clearly difficult negotiations, Soviet Foreign Minister Shevardnadze tried to stress the positive. We are still optimistic, also because we have been able to we have been able to make very encouraging progress on all issues on all items on our agenda without exception. Despite that, Shevardnadze was hard-pressed to point to specific examples of where much progress on arms control had indeed been made. When Secretary of State Baker had his turn, he cited specific issues of disappointment in the difficult area of reducing long-range strategic nuclear missiles. However, we have not as yet come to closure on air launch cruise missiles and sea launch cruise missiles. And that is a disappointment. The two sides still have sharply different views on a united Germany, but Baker indicated the Soviets were softening fact, their demand that it be a neutral agree. country. I do believe that there's an increasing recognition on their part that neutrality is not the answer. With less than eight weeks to go before the summit, it is now clear that the two sides are entering a period of very tough negotiating when reaching agreement will require painful compromise by both sides. John McQuethy, ABC News, the State Department. In a moment, old memories and a new measure of appreciation for the Soviets in Poland. And also on the broadcast this evening, using computers to convince judge and jury. And our person of the week. <laughs> Years ago, when minor arthritis pain made it hard to button my grandson's coat, my doctor recommended the pain reliever and prescription Motrin. Today, he recommends Motrin IB. Motrin IB. No prescription needed. Motrin IB gives me powerful relief from minor arthritis pain. One Motrin IB is as effective as two regular aspirin. My pain and its stiffness just go away, and it's much gentler on my stomach. Motrin IB, doctor recommended pain relief. Help you? Just looking. We interrupt this browsing. 
for another useful tool. Perfect. The card that actually pays you cash back for every charge. That's it. <laughs> the Discover card. Thanks for just browsing. <laughs> it pays to discover the card that pays you back. This John McCrethy report of the future of a unified Germany remains a thorny issue between the United States and the Soviet Union, and it troubles other countries, such as Poland, where the prospect of one Germany raises old fears and surprisingly new attitudes about the Soviet army. ABC's John Donvan is in southeastern Poland. The Soviets have always been strangers in Legnica. The Poles in town may be cordial to the soldiers, may even trade with them on market days but they have never welcomed them. We're under Russian occupation, the Poles always said, pointing out the airbase on the south side of town, resenting so many Russian families living on the block, complaining that with all the Red Army uniforms in sight, they should call their town Little Moscow. The Poles have spelled it out clearly, Soviets go home. Then the two Germanys started talking about unification, and that's when many Poles began thinking that perhaps the Soviet army should stay a while as security against the Germans. Poles here cannot forget that their town, like a third of Poland, once belonged to a powerful Germany until the maps were redrawn at the end of World War II. Now they fear that a united Germany will want it back. It will be difficult for the Germans to forget about these lands. It could even be a military threat. The Germans were never our friends. I think Polish people are afraid. Every Pole grows up knowing that Soviet forces helped save Poland from the Germans in World War II. Even if the Soviets stayed longer than Poles wanted, they proved themselves a deterrent against German aggression. This is the Russian house. This is the Polish house, the Russian house. Peter Yashcha, born after the war, never liked growing up among Soviets and he wants them out now but his parents remember the Nazis and feel safer with the Red Army. According to a recent survey, half the nation feels safer with the Red Army. It pains us to have the Soviet Army on Polish soil, but it is worth it to us because we will have peace on our border with Germany. It does not mean the Soviets are suddenly popular in Legnica, but at a time when Soviet power is in retreat in most of Eastern Europe, this is a change of heart the Poles themselves never expected. John Donvan, ABC News, Legnica, Poland. Another example today of how the changing relationship between East and West has Pentagon strategists scrambling to catch up. As ABC's Bob Zelnick reports from Washington, one of the Navy's ambitious new submarine programs may find itself the victim of the budgetary acts. Once more, we play our dangerous game with our old adversaries, the American Navy. The game, submarine warfare. Advantage the Soviet Union. This thing could park a couple of hundred warheads off Washington. Nobody would know a thing about it until it was all over. That is fiction. Man battle station. In the real world, U.S. attack submarines which hunt down and destroy other subs have the edge. But the Soviets now are launching new subs that are faster, quieter, and harder to detect. They are eliminating old submarines, noisy submarines, submarines that they probably wouldn't uh, take to war, uh, and replacing them uh, with uh, higher performance submarines. The U.S. Navy is planning to counter with its own new attack submarine, the Seawolf. The Navy says when it joins the fleet in 1995, Seawolf will be quieter, have more firepower, and better sonar than any Soviet submarine. But each Seawolf will cost more than one billion dollars and the Navy wants 29 of them. At a time of budget cutbacks, and when the Soviet Navy is stressing defensive operations close to its own shores, even friends of the military say the Seawolf may no longer be needed. In light of uh, Soviet curtailment of many of their submarine operations, I think we have to reevaluate it. Defense Secretary Cheney has ordered a review of the Seawolf program. Pentagon sources predict the Navy will be told to buy only a few of the boats. The gamble is that future clashes with the Soviets will happen only in the movies. Bob Zelnick, ABC News at the Pentagon. Still overseas, in the Himalayan kingdom of Nepal, a pro-democracy demonstration turned deadly today. As many as 50 people were killed when troops opened fire on thousands of demonstrators as they marched on the royal palace. 
in Kathmandu. Hours earlier, the king had dissolved the government and promised reform, but the opposition said it wasn't enough. Ten more are dead in the fighting between rival black factions in the South African province of Natal. The death toll since last week is now at least 67. In our next segment, computers recreating an accident right in the courtroom. The facts speak for themselves. to advanced full color. America's most popular copier is Canon. Call toll-free 1-800-OK-CANON. Did I tell you about that? No. When Dick Mankovich oh, joined UPS in 1960... You still got to work. Still got to deliver the bundles. We way. didn't go to Bangkok or Budapest. Looking good, Mankovich. We didn't even go to West Virginia then. Very icy, very slippery. Uh, you want to take extra care as you're driving out there. Let's go out and uh, have a good one. We didn't have our own fleet of planes or 100,000 vehicles for the capacity to deliver more packages more efficiently than any company on Earth. But thanks to people like Dick Mankovich. Hey, how you doing, Norm? Oh, hi, Dick. We do now. Some window. <laughs> when choosing a new car, don't compromise. Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme SL is longer and wider. It accelerates faster than Ford Taurus. It's more powerful, yet gets better highway gas mileage than Honda Accord. And it has a better owner satisfaction plan than both. Which obviously makes Cutlass Supreme the smarter choice. All the way around. This is the new generation of all. Now get up to $2,600 cash back on a 1990 Cutlass Supreme. See your old dealer today. There has been another one of those nightmare fires in a residential hotel. This one in Miami Beach early this morning sent the mostly elderly residents into the streets in their robes and night clothes. At least three people are dead and nine are unaccounted for. The hotel had smoke alarms, but it didn't have any sprinklers. We have a report tonight on a technological revolution in the courtroom. In Detroit, a trial is underway to determine who or what was responsible for the crash of a Northwest Airlines jet nearly three years ago. One of the key witnesses is a computer. Here's ABC's Ken Kashiwahara. August 1987, a Northwest Airlines jet crashes near the Detroit airport. Who is legally liable? In a courtroom, attorneys for the plane's manufacturer turn to high-tech testimony to support their claim that the pilots were at fault. Wow. Using data from the flight recorder, a computer is used to recreate the takeoff to convince a jury that improperly set wing flaps caused the crash. It is the latest twist in the traditional courtroom battle. Attorneys or expert witnesses trying to win over juries with sketches and diagrams. Now, computer experts are persuading a growing number of lawyers that three-dimensional computer animation is easier for juries to understand, more interesting, and more convincing. It's a whole new way of, of getting across some, what can be very technical information. Computer animation is created from engineering data gathered at the scene of an accident and used in lawsuits to support a point of view showing what a pilot may or may not have seen, what the driver of a car did or did not see, what an eyewitness claimed he or she saw. After a car killed a pedestrian on this Washington, D.C. street, the lawyer for the driver commissioned a computer graphic, attempting to prove that the accident was unavoidable. It was so convincing, he says, the case was settled out of court. One day they were asking for over $2 million dollars and the next day the case settled for approximately six hundred thousand dollars in houston texas a roller coaster rider sued an amusement park claiming he suffered a stroke on the ride even though eight million other riders had no such problems to convince the jury his attorney commissioned a computer model of the roller coaster to demonstrate his complicated theory that g-forces snapped his client's head causing a tear in the artery i don't personally feel that we could have prevailed in this case without the ability to demonstrate to the jury what our theory was. Anna M. agrees. As a juror, she says the computer graphics helped convince her to vote for the injured man. Actually seeing how it could have happened made it so much easier and simple and colorful also. Computer animation is expensive, up to $100,000. But attorneys who have used the technology predict that eventually the costs will come down, that in the future, 
high-tech testimony will become the legal weapon of choice. Ken Kashiwahara, ABC News, San Francisco. Business news today, United Airlines may be about to become the biggest employee-owned company in the U.S. UAL has agreed to sell the corporation to its three biggest unions, the pilots, mechanics, and flight attendants, for about four and a half billion dollars. In order to raise that kind of money, the unions say they will cut their own wages by two billion dollars and promise no strikes. The unemployment rate dropped one-tenth of a percent last month, back to 5.2 percent. In still another sign of a sluggish economy, only 26,000 new jobs were created in March. That is the fewest in any month in three and a half years. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones Industrials lost about four points today. The trading was slow. For the week, stocks gained nearly 10 points. When we come back, how do you find a good athlete? Easy. You just try Conation. For over 80 years, Murphy's Oil Soap has cleaned all kinds of wood in all kinds of houses. But is it good enough to tackle this house? Murphy's, the pure natural cleaner that's safe to use on almost any wooden surface, can stand up to the toughest test and pass with flying colors. If Murphy's Oil Soap is good enough to clean Sigma Delta, it's surely good enough to clean your house. Today, it's getting harder and harder to spot some denture wearers. Harder to tell who is and who isn't because they don't look or feel like denture wearers. They use extra hold fast teeth. It has a thin, powerful seal that's virtually airtight. So powerful, you'll get a better hold than any leading powder. So natural, you'll hardly feel it. And if you don't know your dentures are there, how can anyone else? Extra hold fast teeth. Nothing's closer to real. Chrysler announces the Guaranteed Advantage Sellathon with all three savings advantages. Guaranteed rebates up to $2,000. Option package savings up to $1,000. Millions in factory-to-dealer incentives. Dodge Shadow, the lowest-priced car in America equipped with an airbag. The gold standard Jeep Cherokee with the most powerful engine in its class. Plymouth Acclaim, more room and a better value than Honda Accord. And now you can save over $1,000 in America's best-selling minivans. Join us for the biggest sellathon in Chrysler's history. Whole grain nutrition is important, but only one of these leading cereals has it. Only Wheaties is made with 100% whole grain. Just ask Michael Jordan. Better get your whole grain. Better eat your Wheaties. So you want to be a cook? Make it shine. No fumes easy off oven cleaner is heat activated. So there are no gloves, no harsh fumes. No smell? And no grease. Not bad, kid. No fumes easy <laughs> off the easy way out of a dirty oven. Our next story this evening is about picking winners and this question. What is it about an athlete beyond one's physical condition that separates winners from losers? How do you measure things like heart and drive and spirit and soul? ABC Stick Schaap has found someone in Phoenix, Arizona who thinks she knows the answer. When Dan Marley of the Phoenix Suns hurdles through the air and slam dunks, one fan may cheer a little louder than most. Her name is Kathy Colby and she is cheering for Marley's jam and her own judgment. Two years ago, she advised the Suns to draft the little-known Marley. When we recommend Marley, we didn't just recommend Marley, we said, take him, take him, take him. She'd never seen Dan Marley play, had no idea if he was left-handed, right-handed, tall or short, or anything about him, but she evaluated his test and said, this guy has heart and he'll be a great player if he has any skill at all. And uh, he's been exactly what she said he would be, uh, the toughest guy on the floor every night he goes out there. Anybody remember what word I found it under in the thesaurus? Kathy Colby, a consultant to the Suns, is the creator of the Colby Conative Index, a test that measures a person's conation. What is conation? It sounds familiar, but it isn't. It is defined in a book called The 1,000 Most Obscure Words in the English Language as the area of one's mentality it has to do with desire, volition, and striving. In other words, the will to win. You know, I was kind of nervous taking it because I didn't know if I was giving her the right answer or the wrong answer, but I think everything worked out. There are no right answers. Colby's test simply shows whether a person is primarily one of four types. A quick start, who is a risk taker. A fact finder, who plays the percentages. A follow-through who sticks to the game plan. 
or an implementer who is instinctive and physical. Dan is a very talented implementer. This means he's a natural athlete who is going to be banging under the boards. He's going to be a guy who's going to play right up against another player. He's going to play a very, very physical game. The whole key to team building is to find people with the right cognitive mix so that they, they create a synergy between them. What she brought to the table was two things that we could never do. We can't make an incision in the forehead and we can't make an incision over the heart to really see what's inside that person. Two years ago, the Suns were one of the worst teams in the NBA. Now, they are one of the best. Clearly, Kathy Colby has given them a hand. Dick Schaap, ABC News, Phoenix. In other news, there has been another attack on one of the world's most famous paintings. A man entered the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam and sprayed a chemical on Rembrandt's painting, Night Watch. Despite the appearance, experts say it only damaged some protective varnish. The man was described as confused, and he was arrested. We'll be back in just a moment. World News Tonight with Peter Jennings and the Person of the Week are brought to you by Citicorp. Citicorp, America's first global financial services corporation, has the power and the resources to help you with all your financial needs. Our bank, Citibank, is the most widely used by American corporations and individuals. As Citicorp and Citibank, we serve over 27 million customers in 90 countries. In fact, Citicorp, known worldwide as the financial leader, is ready to do whatever it takes to help you succeed. Citicorp, because Americans want to succeed, not just survive. Now on Ford Escort, get 2.9 financing or $1,000 cash back. Plus Ford's new $500 cash bonus offer for first-time buyers. It's the biggest offer ever on Ford Escort, and it's on all 1990 Ford Escorts. It can mean savings of up to $1,500 on the world's best-selling car. Ford Escort, it's the biggest offer ever. Have you driven a Ford? Did you know that even though your 800 service is working perfectly, something could keep you from getting calls? But only AT&T automatically Hello? covers you with our 800 assurance policy. Within one hour, we can reroute 800 calls to any working phone and any other office, guaranteed. Reliability, another AT&T advantage. Call today about our special 800 offer. The risks and rewards of having children after 40. How dangerous is it? Follow this woman through the miracle of birth. Plus, crying. We're told not to do it, but we all do. Learn the emotional and physical benefits of shedding a tear on 2020 tonight. Finally this evening, our person of the week. First, some best wishes. In January of last year, we chose as the person who made a difference, Marjorie Stoneham Douglas, the conservationist and writer who has done so incredibly much over the years for the protection of the Florida Everglades. Tomorrow, Mrs. Douglas will be 100. Right on, we say. This week, we have chosen someone quite a bit younger. A committed person, nonetheless, someone who was just going along in life until one day he noticed how much trouble other people were having. Right from the beginning, this was going to be a celebration. This was going to be about um, having, doing what you really enjoy doing in life and have it make a difference for other people. And the executive director of 2000 Love, Jonathan Clark. Jonathan Clark gave a year and a half of his life to this event and he pulled it off. The 2000 Love Tennis Tournament to aid in the fight against world hunger held this week in Landover, Maryland. It was John Clark's brainchild. It was a major effort getting the Capitol Center, getting free advertising, getting free television. Over this past year and a half, I never said it wasn't going to happen. It was, there wasn't ever a time when I said this wasn't going to happen. And it meant attracting big name players like John McEnroe and Andre Agassi. These guys would make $100,000 a night doing exhibition matches. And they donated their time to come here and play for free. The tennis lacked the intensity of a major tournament perhaps, but it was no less entertaining. And it served a much higher purpose, to raise money for the world's hungry. $350,000 this week, 
and to raise awareness. Andre Agassi is sometimes known as one of the brats in professional tennis. Well, there are a lot of demands that are put on my time, and uh, when they told me that 35,000 people a day die of hunger, 26,000 of which are under the age of four, gosh, that really hit me in a hard way, and I said, man, I got to do my, my part in uh, making a dent in that statistic. Only two years ago, John Clark was teaching tennis at a suburban club in Washington. It was this film, made by The Hunger Project, that began to turn his life around. Almost everyone saw hunger and starvation as inevitable. Seeing that on the video, uh, it just, like, woke me up. What particularly impressed John Clark was the distinction the film made between famine, affecting 10% of the world's hungry, and chronic, persistent hunger, affecting the other 90%. It seemed to me that the world was working on the wrong problem, that everybody, you know, we were getting good at handling famines. We could ship the food over there real quick and feed people. But if uh, but there's people who are living day to day with uh, um, malnutrition and, and uh, they simply don't have the income to buy food that's right down the street. So John Clark quit his teaching job and began thinking about how to organize a tennis tournament that would help to eradicate hunger by the year 2000 there by the name, 2000 Love. Here's a guy who uh, was not on a world-class tennis player. He's a great tennis player, but not a world-class tennis player. But behind that particular skill was a very, very deep and passionate commitment to have hunger end. Where this tennis tournament made a big difference is that 10,000 people attended. Um, over 10 million people watched it on television. It's going out to cable networks this weekend to tens of millions of people. And they got the message that hunger need no longer exist. It's no longer a matter of lack of food, but a matter of lack of opportunity. And you as an individual can make a difference. As a child growing up in Connecticut, John Clark, like many kids, knew exactly what he wanted to be when he grew up. You know, we've all had visions in life of how we wanted uh, our lives turn out. When I was a little kid, I wanted to be a jet pilot. Well, that didn't happen. And while he never made it to a level higher than journeyman tennis player, this week, John Clark clearly belongs in the first division. I actually am in a place where I can provide an opportunity for other people's lives to make a difference. Uh, and for me, that's thrilling. I, I don't think I could ask for anything more. And so we choose John Clark, a man who finds the suffering of his fellow man totally unacceptable. We hope he makes a bundle because he'll surely pass it on. That's our report on World News tonight. I'm Peter Jennings. Have a good weekend, and we'll see you on Monday. Good night. This has been World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. This has been a presentation of ABC News, where more Americans get their news than from any other source.